Hello, welcome to the screencast on the required practical called Energy Changes in Neutralization, which is part of the ones you have to know for C1. OK, we're going to start, as we start every lesson, with a retrieval practice. So I want you to pause the video now and come back when you've answered the questions. OK, welcome back. Uh, let's self-assess our work. So, name two methods we can use to get an ionic compound to conduct electricity. Right, so the two methods are we can melt the solid or dissolve the solid in water. Why do ionic compounds have high melting points? They have high melting points because they have strong electrostatic forces between oppositely charged ions. So it requires a lot of energy needed to pull the ions apart. State why the following elements are isotopes. So an isotope is where you have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. So they all have eight protons, but they have different numbers of neutrons. So the first one's got eight, the second one's got nine, and the third one's got 10. There is another way of actually describing it. You can say that they have the same atomic number, but a different mass number. Complete the following. Metals can conduct electricity because there are delocalized electrons that can move and carry charge in the structure. Describe what happens when two atoms of potassium react with one atom of sulphur. So here we have a diagram. Sulphur needs two more to complete its outer shell and potassium need to lose one, which is why we have two of them. OK, so each potassium atom loses one electron to form an ion with a charge of plus one. One atom of sulphur gains both of these electrons to form an ion with a charge of minus two. So the formula would be K2S. Describe a similarity and one difference between the plum pudding model and the nuclear model of the atom. So both have positive and negative charges. Both of them are neutral overall. Differences, no neutrons or protons in the plum pudding. No nucleus. Electrons are not arranged in shells. The nuclear model, the mass is concentrated at the centre of the atom, whereas in the plum pudding, they are, it's more dispersed. Okay, so the formula for aluminium hydroxide is Al, open brackets, OH, close brackets, 3. So we need to treat the hydroxide ion as like a whole thing together. We need to multiply the whole thing by 3. OK, so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the required practical for the energy change in a neutralisation reaction. So we want to be able to describe how to measure the energy released by a chemical reaction. We want to be able to use data from a graph to determine the exact point of neutralization. And we want to be able to suggest sources of error in the investigation and explain how we can make improvements. OK, so energy transfer in chemical reactions. We've done this in a previous topic. Chemicals store different amounts of energy. During a chemical reaction, energy is transferred between the reaction mixture and the surroundings. Some reactions give out energy, they're exothermic, and some take in energy, they're endothermic. So the amount of energy transferred during a reaction is proportional to the temperature change of the reaction. How could we measure the energy transfer in a laboratory? So what equipment would we need? What readings would we have to take? 
and how would we go about minimizing errors? Okay, so if we were investigating the temperature change in a neutralization reaction, right? So we've got an acid and a base, or an acid and an alkali, and we'll get a salt and water. When neutralization reaction occurs, it is an exothermic reaction. So what we're going to do is when we measure the highest temperature reached, this will be the point of complete neutralization because it means no more reaction is going to occur after that. So you are going to calculate how much alkali is needed to neutralize two molar hydrochloric acid by measuring the temperature when different volumes of alkali are added. So we're adding different amounts of alkali to a set amount of hydrochloric acid. So what is our independent variable? What are we changing in this reaction? We're changing the volume of sodium hydroxide because it says that we are adding different volumes. What are we measuring? What's our dependent variable? What will change when we add different amounts of, of sodium hydroxide? What are we measuring? We're measuring the temperature that it reaches. So what do you think we need to keep the same? In order to see the effect of the volume of sodium hydroxide on the temperature, what do you think we might need to keep the same? Okay, what we need to keep the same would be the concentration of the acid. It needs to be kept at two molar. The volume of the acid. We probably also need to keep the same lid, the same cup, right? We, we're not going to change anything like that in between our reactions. Okay, so copy this table and complete why it is needed. So pause the video now and come back when you've done it. Okay, so the polystyrene cup, the polystyrene is an insulator. So we're using it to hold the reactants, but also act as an insulator. So we're not going to lose the energy that we're trying to measure by measuring the temperature. So by it being an insulator and not a metal cup, we're minimizing the heat loss to the surroundings. Okay, the plastic lid, it's to minimize again the energy loss to the surroundings by evaporation. Why do we need a thermometer? We need it to record the temperature of the solutions as they're reacting. Why do you need a measuring cylinder? We need it to accurately measure out the volumes of hydrochloric acid at the beginning and the amounts of sodium hydroxide that you're adding at a time. Why do you need a pipette? To transfer the acid and alkali safely into the measuring cylinder. And the stirring rod is to ensure that the reactants are fully mixed together and neutralization has occurred. Okay, so the method we're going to use, and this would be what you would need to write in an examination. We're going to use a measuring cylinder to put 30 centimeters cubed of dilute hydrochloric acid into the polystyrene cup. We need to take the temperature at the beginning. That's very important because we need to know what we started at so we can measure how high it's gone. We're going to put five centimeters cubed of sodium hydroxide solution into a small measuring cylinder. Add the sodium hydroxide, right, into the acid. When the reading on the thermometer stops increasing, 
write down the temperature in your table. Add further 5 cm3 portions of sodium hydroxide to the cup 5 cm at a time. So you're adding the first 5, then you'll add another 5 to make 10, and then you add another 5 to make 15, until a total of 40 cm3 have been added. And you're going to keep writing down the maximum temperature on the thermometer. Once you've done that, you can repeat steps one to six two more times so that you've got three sets of results. Then calculate the mean temperature for each volume of sodium hydroxide. So calculate the mean temperature for five centimeters cubed, the mean temperature for 10, the mean temperature for 15, etc. Okay. So I want you to pause the video now and we'll just have this first checkpoint of what we've done so far. So pause the video now and answer the questions. Okay, what is an exothermic reaction? An exothermic reaction is one that releases heat energy to the environment. What happens to the temperature in an exothermic reaction? The temperature increases. In the equipment we use for our experiment, why did we use a polystyrene cup? To hold the reactants and reduce heat loss as polystyrene is a good insulator. Why did we use a lid? To minimise the energy lost to the surroundings by evaporation. Why did we use a thermometer? To measure the temperature of the reactants. What were your control variables? Our control variables are the volume of acid, the concentration of acid, and the concentration of sodium hydroxide. How did you always make sure that they were kept constant? They were always kept the same. So how did we keep the volume of acid, the concentration and the um, concentration of sodium hydroxide the same? Well, the volume of acid, we controlled it using a measuring cylinder. The concentration of the acid, and the concentration of the alkali, we use the same bottle, so we didn't change bottles. So therefore, if you're using the same amount, you're keeping the concentration the same. Name one risk in this experiment and say how you would minimise the effect of this risk. Now we're using acids and alkalis here. So you've known from year seven what we need to do, right? The risk, the sodium hydroxide, and the hydrochloric acid are irritant. They are, can damage your skin. So if you get it on your skin, you need to wash it off. It can get into your eyes and be really, really quite serious. So in order to stop that, you would wear safety glasses. Okay, so that's our first success criteria. Now we want to look at the results and determine the exact point of neutralization. So here is a set of results obtained by a group uh, who did this experiment. So what I want you to do is calculate the mean maximum temperature for each volume of sodium hydroxide. Now remember in when you're doing that, that you need to add them up and divide by three, but only if you consider that each and every result in of the three are worth adding in. So there's none that are anomalous, that don't fit in with the pattern. Okay, so you might need a calculator for this. So pause the video now, get yourself a calculator and calculate the mean values. Okay, welcome back. Uh, right, let's go through the mean temperatures. So the first one, I consider them all to be valid. So it's 20.7. You notice that I have done it to one decimal place, the same as the precision that is demonstrated in the results. The second one, 
I am going to ignore that second trial because it's too large and I've got 24.3. If I was to actually put what it is in a calculator, it would come out as 24.25. But because I want to keep it to one decimal place, the same as the results, I'm going to round it up to 24.3. Right, the next one, 27.1. 29.0, 31.0, I'm disregarding that trial one and I've got 32.8, 32.4, 31.7 and 30.8. Now when we get a set of results like this, we need to then draw a graph. Okay, so our x-axis will have our independent variable, the volume of sodium hydroxide added. And our y-axis will have the mean maximum temperature of the, the reaction. Okay, so what unit should be on each axis? So what did we measure the volume of sodium hydroxide in? Centimeters cubed and degrees C is what we measure temperature in. If you have graph paper at home, I want you to try and plot a graph of your mean maximum temperature from the previous page, okay? And draw a smooth curve of best fit. Circle any anomalous results. So you can pause the video now and try and do that. If you haven't, Right, you could try and sketch graph it. Okay, your graph should have a shape like this. Okay. What you are then asked to do is draw two straight lines of best fit. One through the points where the temperature is increasing and one where the temperature is decreasing. OK, so there's your line of best fit for the increasing and there's your line of best fit for the decreasing. OK, where the lines intersect, if we were to go down to the bottom X axis, it would tell you exactly the volume of sodium hydroxide needed to neutralize the hydrochloric acid. OK. So draw a line down from your graph to find out the volume of sodium hydroxide needed to neutralize the acid. Okay, now from the, where I drew it, I found it to be 23. So the volume of sodium hydroxide needed is 23 centimeters cubed. You need to be able to describe how you do this, right? Uh, it's very unusual that you have to do two lines of best fit on any graph, but in this one, it does require you to do that. Okay, once we know how much alkali was needed to neutralize the acid, we can write a conclusion. So this is the conclusion that I would get. The volume of sodium hydroxide needed to neutralize the acid was 23 centimeters cubed. This is where the neutralization reaction stopped releasing energy. The temperature stopped rising and so neutralization was complete. All the acid had reacted with the alkali. My results show that the temperature kept rising until neutralization had fully occurred and then the temperature began to decrease. I found that the exact point that my two lines of best fit intercepted was at 23 centimetres cubed. OK. So that does require you to learn. It's a bit tricky trying to describe that, but it does need you to know the technique and what you have to do with the graph for the practical. 
Okay, so we're going to look at sources of error in the investigation and try and see if we can suggest improvements and explain how they would be better. Okay, so first of all, we could carry this out with other types of reaction. Okay, so you could do it with an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction. And you know what? The AQA could ask you to do this. So it may not be hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. They could give you another type of reaction. So for instance, an acid and a metal is exothermic. So if it's exothermic, you're going to expect a temperature increase. Okay, so you could change the type of metal, the concentration of acid, the type of acid, the volume of acid, the mass of metal. But you would do the whole thing in the same way that we did this particular practical. You could do an acid reacting with carbonate. Again, it's exothermic, so you're going to get an increase. You're going to change the type of carbonate, copper carbonate, calcium carbonate, whatever. The concentration of acid, the volume of acid, the type of acid, the mass of carbonate. Any of those could be changed and investigated. A displacement reaction. Again, exothermic, so it's an increase in temperature. Right? You could change the difference in reactivity of the reactants. So you could try reacting copper with magnesium, copper with zinc, copper with lead, copper with tin. Okay, you could change the mass and volume of reactants. You could do a different neutralization reaction. All right, so it doesn't have to be sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. You could use um, potassium hydroxide and sulfuric acid okay again it's an exothermic reaction so we're increasing in temperature and you could change the concentration of acid alkali the volume of acid the volume of alkali etc you could do an endothermic reaction okay so citric acid and sodium hydrogen carbonate in that case you would be expecting a decrease and when it stops decreasing, that would be the end of the reaction. We could change the mass of citric acid, the volume, the concentration of sodium hydrogen carbonate. So that is in case that the AQA decide to do the same required practical, but with different substances. Okay. So. The temperature change depends on the reactivity of the metal. A student wants to place copper, iron, magnesium and zinc in order of their reactivity. OK, so suggest three pieces of equipment needed for the investigation and their purpose and describe a method to find the position of an unknown metal. OK, I want you to pause the video now and come back when you've answered the question. OK, so three pieces of apparatus needed for the investigation. OK, you need any three from you need a thermometer to measure the temperature, a polystyrene cup, a mass balance to measure the amount of metal and a measuring cylinder. The method, OK, add all of the metals to an acid one at a time. Measure the temperature change and place the metals in order of temperature change. What you would keep the same was the volume of acid used, the concentration of acid used, the same starting temperature of the acid, and you must use the same mass of metal. OK. Here's another checkpoint to check your understanding. OK, so pause the video now and come back when you've answered these questions. OK, suggest three ways to improve the following apparatus to measure the energy change in a neutralization reaction and explain your answer. OK, 
First one, use a polystyrene cup or an insulated cup. That would mean that all the temperature that you are measuring is from the reaction and you're not losing it to the environment. Use a lid to stop the heat being released and use less reactants to reduce energy loss. The temperature might get too high. The student adds sodium hydroxide to hydrochloric acid, but notices a smaller than expected temperature change. Suggest why. The heat might have escaped through the glass and it might have escaped through evaporation. So the temperature rise is not as high as it should be. The student adds ammonium chloride to different volumes of water. Why is the reaction endothermic? Well, the reaction is endothermic because we notice that the temperature has decreased. So energy has been taken in from the surroundings. Name two control variables for the experiment. The mass of ammonium chloride and water from the same source or use distilled water. OK, so that is the end of this screencast on the required practical energy change. I hope you've understood it. It does require you to learn the method, but also be ready for it to be in a different form. But ideally, it still will have that same graph with the two lines of best fit to get the point where the reaction is complete. Okay, bye-bye.